All right, uh, good afternoon. Um, my first exposure to AIBD meeting, it's, it's wonderful to drive around to the Disney properties and then come to a scientific meeting. Talking to Jessica and David, the content here is amazing. I, I really congratulate you on getting a great uh, program together and focusing on C. diff. So in Houston, I run a strain typing lab. We collect leftover stool samples from uh, patients with C. diff and, and strain type them, ribotyping. So we report back to the hospitals for outbreaks, um, uh, transmission events, that sort of stuff. And we do the same thing with environmental samples. We, we do go into the hospitals and see if there's a, a burden of C. diff in the environment. I had a recent grad student who looked at the salad bars in, in, local, in our local hospitals. And they actually also went into uh, fast food restaurants that have the salad bars as open. Uh, guess what the positivity is of those spores? Forty percent. So if you're not into C. diff after this lunch, you really, really should be. <laughs> so so my, my 15 minutes is, is directed towards treatment. So Jessica set me up very nicely. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of C. diff out there, we know that. Uh, historically, this was a piece of cake infection to treat. You just picked one of two antibiotics and hope for the best. But, but the knowledge of the microbiome and our adaptive immunity has, has really been a game changer. And as the incidence rates has gone up of C. diff, the drug discovery in C. diff has also really gone up. So when you think of treatment of C. diff, split it into three goals. It's a microbiome dysbiosis disease. So we have to somehow cure that dysbiosis. Uh, we still need to kill that bug, so we'll still need some antibiotics. And if we could augment our immune system, that would be good as well. So, so think of those three major goals when you think of treatment of C. diff. And once you have that in your head, it's somewhat of a piece of cake to then stratify your treatment strategies by whether or not it's correcting the dysbiosis or killing the bug or perhaps augmenting your immune response. And so as we go through the treatments, I'll kind of categorize it into these three categories and see how we should be treating our patients. So I will, uh, as you know, there's been a recent update to the IDSA SHEA guidelines, and a lot of my treatment will be the, the new updates. Now, if you remember the 2010 guidelines, it was mild to moderate disease, use metronidazole, severe disease, use vancomycin, and for what's now called fulminant disease, use the combination IV metronidazole and vancomycin. So what I want to do to start with is, is show you the sentinel, sentinel studies that were present between the 2010 and then the 27 updates, and then how that updated the guidelines. The most important update for me personally on the guidelines was, was the inclusion of my name. Uh, that was important to me, but uh, there was some other important stuff too that I will, I, I will go through that stuff. This may be the most important slide, and this was the most important deliberation in terms of changes to the guidelines. So we've always known vancomycin was superior for severe disease. And metronidazole was sort of percolating along. So there was this drug called telivimer. It's a toxin binder. After this, never think of telivimer again. But telivimer went into this wonderful, had this wonderful phase two study. They said, let's go for the indication phase three. And they probably just had too much money. They said, well, metronidazole is often used. Vancomycin has the indication as guideline preferred. Which one should we use? And essentially, they just said, we don't know. So let's use them both. So in this indication trial, there is this absolutely wonderful, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized study of metronidazole versus vancomycin, FDA indication study. And no need to stratify by severity, just global overall, metronidazole was globally inferior. Metronidazole was globally inferior to vancomycin for clinical cure. Now you can see the recurrence rates are not good for either. That 0.23 with metronidazole means 23%, and 0.21 is, is 21%. So either metronidazole or vancomycin, that's still the Achilles heel, but in a FDA indication trial, vancomycin was superior. Uh, this did not make the guidelines because it was too late, but it's an important addition. This is a population-based study in the VA where they propensity matched patients who were given vancomycin to very similar patients given metronidazole. And those metronidazole patients had a higher risk of death, mortality, compared to patients given vancomycin. So now you have an FDA indication trial that says globally inferior metronidazole, and metronidazole death rates are up. So you can take a wild guess what's going to happen to the guidelines. Now, anybody with a couple of gray hairs will be going, 
that's like totally crazy because I, in the 80s and 90s, used to like give everyone metronidazole and they had these wonderful response rates. So if you, if you asked any card-carrying infectious diseases gastroenterology expert, why is my drug not working as well anymore? They would all raise their hand and they'd say, it's likely resistance, dummy. We're probably getting resistant to the agent. Now remember, in, in the world of C. diff, we don't culture the organism, we just detect the toxins. So you need people like us that have these huge biobanks that pull them out of the minus 80 every now and then and do MIC susceptibility testing. And, and just go down that laundry list of MIC 90, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, turns into a one. And then as you go to the very bottom, that's the, that's the epidemic strain. And that, that 0.25 has become a two over time. And then if you say, well, let's just run around the hospital for a while and, and collect stool samples from patients with metronidazole, the best you will ever get for a concentration is nine. The best. And many, many patients will have one or less micrograms per gram of, of drug in their stool. So if you have an MIC of two and you have a drug concentration of one, it's somewhat of a no-brainer that you're going to see a lot of failure rates. So the best guess for why metronidazole is failing is, is most likely resistance issue. So, so you take that all together and then that essentially gets rid of metronidazole. Now in many, many hospitals, metronidazole is still about 40% of usage, so that's a vexing problem in hospitals. Community use is still very easy to get, metronidazole, so how are we going to change the paradigm to get rid of metronidazole? But now regardless of severity, it's vancomycin or fidaxomycin. The fulminant episode still includes metronidazole, which is a problem, but it's only there because we have no other IV alternative at the moment. So it's a research area to try to discover a new IV antibiotic for C. difficile. So, so now as you think of your cartoon, it gets even easier. Just put a little red box over that metronidazole. And, and so in, in terms of the drug treatment, we're really left with, well, what should I choose? vancomycin versus fidaxomycin. How will its guidelines us in the same box, so it's, it's, so it's in there together. So how am I going to choose which one to use, vanco versus fidaxo? And I, I think I highlight this. So the real bang for your buck when you pull fidaxomycin out of the closet is that having of the recurrence rate. You get the exact same clinical cure as you do with vancomycin, but you have a decreased risk of recurrence. And so it's more expensive, it's a branded antibiotic. So the question is, is that worth the bang for your buck? Is it worth it to use fidaxomycin? And this is a former fellow of mine, Sam Aiken. Uh, he's now at MD Anderson Cancer Center. He's a superstar clinical pharmacist over there. So we have an, uh, this ongoing clinical trial that I was describing follows C. diff patients once, they're, once they've left, left the hospital. We call them up, how you doing? Do you have a recurrence? And if you have a recurrence, will you be hospitalized? And that's what this is trying to illustrate. So for patients with C. diff who are hospitalized, who are discharged, and they get a recurrence, that 45.3, about half the time they're readmitted to the hospital. And 10% of the time, they go directly to the ICU. So, so that's starting to sound like it's quite expensive. And then this is, um, the problem with, with Sam's study is that it doesn't really tell you whether or not a drug could help that or not. So this is a guy named Jason Gallagher who's just outside of Philadelphia. And he convinced a hospital uh, essentially to drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, everybody in that hospital who has C. diff, they switched over from Vanco to Fidaxomycin. And so you see they boosted the pharmacy's uh, budget. At 62000 they had a blow on Fidaxo. But because of the downstream decreased hospitalizations once they switched over, they saved about 250 k in hospitalization costs. Now, you know, the silos of a hospital, it's hard to convince one group to give money to another group, but at least this is the cost-effectiveness studies that help you make that decision. Uh, this is actually, uh, the, the Europeans, unfortunately, did us one better. It's a dude named Simon Goldenberg, who's a clinical microbiologist. But he convinced one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different hospitals to do pretty much the exact same thing. But, but some did, like, everybody switched over. That's A and B hospital. Some did it exclusively if you have a, a recurrent CDI. And other ones used it willy-nilly. Uh, whatever high-risk patient you want to give it to, go ahead. And those high-risk patients are always the ones on other antibiotics. They've been overly treated with everything else. They have such a terrible microbiome. No way will a narrow-spectrum agent ever help that. So I take that and say, if you're ever going to use fidaxomycin, use it very systematically. 
I will always use it for first recurrence. I will always use it in the IBD population. Or whatever you're trying to do, have a very systematic approach of how do you use it, and then get rid of all the other antibiotics. The one thing that does come up often is, well, okay, I've, I've used Vanco, had a recurrence. I've used standard dose 10-day fidaxomycin, I've had a recurrence. I have a now another recurrence. You're just going to see Jessica, and you're going to get an FMT. But if Jessica's not available, what the heck are you going to do? And you're going to pull out this EXTEND trial. This is a new study with fidaxomycin, but instead of using it for a 10-day course, they actually give it over 25 days, allowing any leftover spores to germinate, and then it's around to kill it, only giving it every other day, the EXTEND trial. If you remember, that's freely available online, and I would say use it exclusively for the fidaxomycin standard dose failures. Wonderful recurrence rates in this, in this particular study. But the real coolness, and obviously in the gastroenterology world, is, is, is the microbiome. It is, it is the area of, of C. diff that is booming. And as Jessica alluded to, but this is my cartoon, you're trying to get to that happy place. And, and the happy place is not just the total abundance of, of bugs that live in your gut, but the diversity. Look at all those different happy smiles in there. And that's what you're trying to get to uh, from what is on the recurrent CDI microbiome, a bunch of bad bugs you don't want. So, so that, that in the guidelines uh, starts at your second or subsequent recurrences. And I think in the discussion point, especially in the IBD population, is that too late? I wonder if this should be earlier in these high-risk patient populations. But, but that's where FNT does come up, and we recommend it in the second or subsequent recurrences. And, and the whole premise here is you have your healthy colon up here, and then your pseudomenomous plaque at the bottom, and you're trying to get back to that healthy spot by re restoring the microbiota that was, was originally there. That, that's the whole premise of, of FMTs. And, and the, the, the level of evidence at this second or further recurrences is actually the highest with FMT. Another study out of, out of Europe uh, where they actually did that, a randomized controlled trial looking at FMT versus placebo. And back then they were wondering, maybe just like the lavage is doing something. So to control for that, there's actually an arm that had lavage but no FMT material. It was so highly effective that it was stopped prematurely. So you look at these numbers, 16 and 13 and 13, you say, that's quite low. But it was stopped prematurely uh, by the Data Safety Monitoring Board because of, the, of the high efficacy rates. You might not have to go see Jessica every single time. This is Johan Bakken out of Minnesota. who had, he's, a, he's the preeminent FMT physician, I think, in the United States. Jessica, you're number two in my mind. And, and he had a whole bunch of people that he wanted to give an FMT but, but couldn't do it because of costs. So he actually ran down to Kroger's, his local grocery store, grabbed kefir, which is just sort of this multi-species prebiotic probiotic and gave it to them over 15 weeks and showed results very similar to his FMT population. So kefir. Uh, last but not least, let's just uh, focus in on the adapt the immune response for a second. Uh, so, so we've always known that the toxins A and B are what causes the disease in C. diff. So you can certainly make monoclonal antibodies directed at these two, at these two targets. And so a company did this, had a spectacular phase two study. Uh, that was more than enough to go into phase three. And in this particular case, they, they nailed it in the phase three. They had two monoclonal antibodies here, one directed against toxin A called actoxumab, and one directed against toxin B called bezlotoximab. For certain reasons that aren't, aren't really understood well, the, the A didn't work very well, but the B caused a reduction in recurrence rates by 50% one-time infusion only, which protects you for approximately three months. So when you now think of bezlotoximab, which I, many of us are using in our GI infusion centers, it's the monoclonal antibody directed against toxin B. Uh, they did a good job in this study of even extending the time period uh, to try to get some HURR work out of it too. And they were able to show that if you give somebody bezlotoximab who was hospitalized to begin with, it did reduce the uh, likelihood of uh, recurrences and, and then re, re readmissions to the hospital because of CDI associated readmissions. So in a very fast run through of treatment, uh, the, maybe the most important thing, think about what you're going to do in a world without metronidazole. Really limit and I would say eliminate metronidazole. Bezaltoxamab is here, go to your infusion centers, make some money off of it, it's great. 
and correct that dysbiosis. We need to have some more emerging science to, to get the F out of the FMT, and I think that's going to be a booming area. So with that, I'll turn it back to David.